Hey everybody, this is Lionel O'Hane from Minecraft. This is Sam Ben Abraham. Uh, we're glad to be here and talk about this topic. It's obviously a very pressing topic that everyone's got a top of mind. And um, when we're thinking about the future of uh, retail, we're thinking about the future of sidewalks, we're thinking about the future of cities. And I'll tell you what struck me, I was in the city uh, around Soho last week and I was completely struck by the animation of what was happening on the sidewalk. And all of a sudden, there were restaurants outside, there was activity, people were turning on music. I saw a young girl um, come out of a van and uh, her family behind her pulling out fold out chairs. They were uh, bringing food out of the van in foil containers. And she started planning on a, uh, a piece of plywood that was covering up a storefront what painting she was going to do. And it seemed like there was a community organizer working there and the whole family came along and said, you know what, let's make an event out of this and let's see what this afternoon looks like. And all around was this kind of like easy young energy that was happening on the sidewalk. And it really made me ask the question, what is standing in the way of where we are today in, in a neighborhood like Soho that's so prolific, that has such a strong brand, that's seen so much transformation that at this moment in time, we can look at the sidewalk as maybe a source of uh, the, the answer to what naturally wants to happen. Sam, um, what, what are your, you're in Soho a lot. What, what do you think is going on over there? I mean, I've been in Soho for 30 years and, uh, you know, I came and I love that place because of the energy that I had in uh, 30 years ago. And uh, over the time, um, we little by little lost it, you know, from restriction from the city and uh, landlords being uh, greedy and this was impossible for young talent to activate almost anything so when we moved there it was a very little retail there was a few cafes there was a bars there was a lot of uh, galleries there was a lot of artists who used to live in those lofts and uh, had the art been showing on the street or upstairs and there was a certain energy to that neighborhood that felt like nowhere else in uh, in new york city and that was kind of like a melting pot for uh, the yuppies that moved from the upper east side and want to have something different and the artists and people it was just like an over the weekend it was just a beautiful uh, mixture of people and uh, in, over the years it became like a shopping mall like uh, any other shopping mall that you go in america and little by little the young generation got pushed out of there and then move into other neighborhood or Brooklyn. Uh, in the last 10 years, it's been uh, pushed to Williamsburg. And then from Williamsburg, that became a little bit too commercial. And then people going into a uh, deeper Brooklyn. And, you know, the city itself lost its energy. What New York was known for uh, all those years. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, it's like the proliferation of uh, development and the intensity and the speed with which New York developed is perfectly, you could draw a graph on how the city gentrified and how artists and creativity and young thinking and opportunity moved further and further away from the city. And I think it's interesting to use Soho as a sort of central kind of like node to understand that. That Broadway that Broadway highway became a mall. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, you, you, you know, because you've been there during the whole time, mm -hmm. you just saw all those rents just escalate so high. And it not only pushed out anything creative, anything unique, right? Nobody can contend with those kind of rents. So anything, even food, there's no food in the center of it. There's no experience. There's no, there's no discovery, right? There's no sense of like, trying to find something new and understand what that neighborhood offers that you can't otherwise get, like you said, anywhere in America. And for the most part, as these national brands moved in, the quality of the experience and the opportunity to like not just go ahead and do it online just kind of evaporated. And, and then the, the, this collapse just happened. I'm interested in how that kind of like this kind of march into the center and then to Williamsburg and then to other parts of Brooklyn, what you're seeing is the the, the machine that has created gentrification, the, the, the kind of values of real estate, right? Like a lot, a lot of what's happening is, is really forced by this idea that banks are really underwriting 
assets, right? And landlords are trying to find credit tenants and credit tenants don't mean healthy sidewalks. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the, the transition is happening much faster every, uh, every time. Like, you know, every neighborhood being developed to, from zero to 100 uh, in like two years and people being forced to be out of there. Uh, you know, it was Soho, and then when meatpacking was uh, developed, it took two years before all the national tenants came in and pushed everybody out. And, you know, so it's, it's really sad to see the city like that. And uh, I think hopefully with this uh, pandemic and this whole social uh, justice movement with the Black Lives Matter, uh, people are going to realize what really matter and uh, things yeah, I think I think I think it's super important to think about these causes and think about what they mean. And, and you know, like I get a little bit nervous when when it's like a pile on of, of 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 this moment in time. We want to talk about this and not really fundamentally understand, like how do we actually address the social justice in the city? And what we talked about um, several times is really this understanding that if a sidewalk works, it works for everybody, right? And that means that I feel like I have ownership of that neighborhood because I'm included in what that neighborhood offers. That the, the, the sum of the neighborhood are the parts that allow it to sort of exist for me to go to a hardware store or to buy a pair of sneakers or to uh, go to a restaurant that I can afford or any of those kind of like parts that speak to the specificity of where you are and the, the, the cultural melting pot of all the people who should be involved in it. And what's happened now is like we've really just pushed neighborhoods into like singular tra traps, right? This is high-end retail, right? This is, you know, discount retail or whatever it is. And, and it's, it's never, it's never going to perform in the way that we want it to perform as long as it's sort of driven by these economic underpinnings. And the other part of it that I think you brought up earlier is just like the community boards and, 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 this, and, and this kind of overlaid kind of like uh, governmental kind of like institutionalized ideas about what you can and can't do in certain neighborhoods. In Soho, you're not allowed to live in Soho and retail is illegal, right? And Soho is just like retail and people living above retail. So every time you want to do a project there, you got to unravel this beast. So I, I just want to finish by on this point on saying like, I actually think this is a great, great opportunity right, right now with what's happening where we have a chance to actually reinvent what retail means what does it actually mean how are you going to get people into stores for me for me it really takes me back to the days when i arrived in new york i arrived in new york 31 years ago and it was the land of opportunity because we came with almost no money we managed to sign a lease based on trust from uh, the landlord and we built our business block by block it was it was uh, uh, um, you know, there was a whole bunch of entrepreneurs in one city and everybody were hungry and everybody came down over the weekend and wanted to see and hear what we have to offer. And I really hope, I, I get the sense, like, you know, like you said, the other day I went back to the city and I felt like, wow, this doesn't even feel like New York City as I know it as the modern New York City. It feels like some European city. It feels like Tel Aviv. It feels like Barcelona. It feels like something that, you know, somebody broke all these rigid rules and regulations that being enforced on everyone uh, to follow. Right. And, and, and I feel like the city needs to loose up a little bit. The city needs right. to loose up. There's got to be a balance between how... You know, it, it it's, cannot be just committing from uh, the suburbs by subway coming in and out and create, you know, there's got to be a life in the city uh, yeah. for the people who walk there and uh, live there. And I, I think that that's a critical point to understand. It's like, look, you, this city is an organism, right? It has its own energy flow, right? The, the, there's, there's a requirement in the city for people who have chosen to live there to take on certain parts of what it means to live in Manhattan. You can't choose to live in downtown Manhattan and then go sit at a community board hearing 
and argue that you want it to be like living in Westchester. It's not living in Westchester. You've chosen, you made this decision, and the city has to sort of like, you can't put patchwork, you can't just put a bunch of Band-Aids all over it and try and make it, you know, a green dog when it really wants to be a purple elephant, right? So the city has its kind of energy and, and animation that it wants. So, so you know what it I is? Think, it's like a lot of, a lot of the community boards, like people who've been living in the neighborhood for 40, 50 years, you know, they got older and the last thing they want is like a little bit of noise after 10 o'clock or a little bit. It's like, they, you, you know what? I'm sorry. I know you want to protect your own interest in there, but you're a little bit irrelevant to what the, uh, the, what the neighborhood should be looking like. You know, there should be young generation also part of the community board have a say because otherwise this neighborhood getting old and it doesn't have anything to offer to the new generation. No, totally. It's interesting. I joined the board some years back of PS122, which is now Performance Space New York. And what happened was when I met the director, he said to me, I said, why should I join PS122? And he said, look, and PS122 does really far out there experimental performance art. And it's not necessarily my thing. I've, I've, I've partaken in it, but it wouldn't be natural for me to join because of the performance art. What he said to me is he said, if you don't support artists working in Manhattan, artists won't work in Manhattan anymore. And Manhattan will become, and New York, he was saying, but Manhattan is like the microcosm of New York. He said Manhattan will become a museum city, like Vienna, like Paris, right? Like you go to St. Petersburg. These are cities where you go and you go, oh, back in the 1800s, so-and-so painted here, and this is so-and-so's shop. But now it's just a museum of a city. It's not real. There's nothing really happening there. And that's the big fear that we have with retail in New York, right? Like if retail can't find a hold, if you can't, we look at it on three levels. If you can't create, a brand experience, a brand today finds its experiential connection with its customer through Amazon or maybe Instagram or maybe Gilt, right? So they don't have control of that conversation anymore. So if they're going to go into retail, they want to control what that experience could actually be. They want something engaging, right? If you're a customer, you, you want a reason to shop, right? Like you, it's a conversion, it's a convergence of entertainment and shopping. You want a reason to go to the place and not just pick it up online. It's not like a convenience that I can get online. It's like they're actually offering me something I wouldn't otherwise get. So you have to have a brand experience. You have to have a commitment to the customer experience. And for the landlords, the landlords need to actually be a partner in this. You can't de-risk themselves and hand all the executional, you know, uh, risk on, the retailer and say, just give me my money. It's just not going to work anymore because the, the, the landlords have to be relevant. And so you have to like have traffic. You have to create a, a sort of traffic component. So it's like relevance to the landlord by traffic experience for the brands and then a kind of entertainment quality for, for users. Those are the same things that you want in the sidewalk, right? They're like you want, and those are how you actually bring a city back to life. And I think that that's the opportunity if retail and the real estate environment in New York is broken. Like you might have rents in retail in New York that are cheaper than commercial rents right now. It's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, in, in Europe, they have this uh, rent control program on, on, uh, on uh, commercial properties. So if you rented a commercial property, you have the right to renew the lease every 10 years at a percentage that has been dictated by the government. Yeah. So you have a 3% escalation. That totally, totally makes sense. You started a small business, whatever the business is, nobody's forcing you because you've been there, you created demand for the street and the vibe for the street, and now you've been pushed out based on the vibe that you created. And somebody else coming in and cash on you, and it's usually right. the landlord, you know. So they have a program. The person who actually enjoyed the key money is the person who created right. the vibe. So the store owner, if you decided to leave the store for whatever reason, he can actually sell right. the lease for key money and get some money for, you know, it's not the landlord. The landlord right. is getting his return on the investment based on this type of uh, calculation. And that's kind of like really protecting. And you see, when you go in Europe, you see a lot more establishment that's been there for many, many years. And you can find 
bookstores and uh, jewelry stores and vintage so there's just a lot more fine objects uh, type of store that you can find in New York City unfortunately uh, we're losing it and we're losing uh, the uh, the consumer desire to find be part of it amazing retail kind of experiences on streets and the second is just like you know when you think about how how stores are it's so seamless online right there's like an there's like a such a clean and clear informational understanding of like what your retail uh, customer is looking for you can you can you can get all the metrics online you can understand everything that they want right you can understand all of the parts of like what they're shopping for. What are they looking at? How much time they spend that? What's the demographic? All that information comes to you when it's coming through online. Now you come to a store and it's the dumbest experience. You have no idea who walked in the store, walked out, how long did they? And so we're trying to like patch it together with all this, all this kind of technology. But the truth is that what you want to be able to do is become temporal. You want to like shop like you're flipping through your social media feed in a physical world. So the, what we have to figure out, and I think there's some people who are trying to figure it out. I think we should talk about Kith for a minute, but I think like what you're starting to understand is like, how do I give online direct to consumer brands an opportunity to be in a zip code so that people can experience their brand? So you have that kind of like, I'm going to give you an opportunity to have an experiential connection with your, 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 uh, your customer. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's, it's a, it's a very tricky experiment to to bring physical to online or bring the online to the physical and how does a, it make a sense together but I, I i'm a big believer in uh, brick and mortar we uh, developing uh, our stores around the world we just open in uh, tokyo next week we're going to open up uh, paris in uh, december and we are a very big believer in physical uh, stores. Um, we designing each one of our stores differently in relationship to the location with our brand DNA in it. So it's definitely not just a cookie cutter uh, type of design. Every this every. A store in every city would be uh, in relationship to the neighborhood and the city. We use in a lot of uh, local uh, resources and uh, designers. Every store has program of local artists that showcase in uh, the product. And every store has distribution of specific product that only available for that specific location. Means back in the days I used to go to Paris to go to a specific store because I knew they can I can find stuff that I cannot find anywhere else. So every store ours has local um, identity that is different than the global identity of the brand. And so that's some of the things that we always do in creating uh, the men to come and people actually looking forward. We, we release in products for the Tokyo store and people say, wow, it's not fair. Now in the pandemic, we cannot even travel. People in America don't want to go to, to uh, Tokyo to pick up the product that is available for that yeah. specific store opening. So, and that's what I think I'm always missing about travel. You know, and Tokyo always give me that because when I go to Tokyo, it's one, big candy yeah. store for me. It's a completely new world. It's a different world, very Japanese. And the food that you eat over there, you can only eat over there. The experience that you have with the service, everything is very much uh, the same as it was 50 years ago. Right. As, as far as the I DNA. Think, I, I think it's an interesting conversation just about food and retail and entertainment right like these are the kind of like components that make up a day of shopping right or like what do we what do we think about we're like hey sam let's go uh let's go to blah 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 and go shopping 
are you thinking about necessarily the exact product that you're going to pick up? That's kind of the mindset of how we shop, you know, how we shop online, right? I need to go get something and you go and you find it and then you compare prices and you buy it. When you say, let's go spend time shopping with a friend or with family members, it's a completely different, it's a different value proposition, it, right? You, you hope it's going to be a discovery. It's discovery, right? You're moments, trying to find yeah. something. And, and so that promise. That you don't even know what you yeah. look. I mean, I just, just imagine in 1900 or in 1880, right? What it was like to walk into a department store, right? You're like, you know, like you go into a city, you're in St. Louis or New York or, you know, anywhere, Cleveland or Chicago or Buffalo. And Don't you go too in, far. In 1980s, 1990, it was in New York City. I mean, there, there right. were still places like that in New York City up until not too long ago. Um, and that, that's still, that's you know. Lost. That's lost. It's largely lost. And I think that that's one of the cues that people need to understand about what retail is. Retail is not buying things. Retail is a, is, is a, is a it's a holodeck into another world, right? We, you, you know, there, there's questions about what do leases look like? Landlords can't just get the free pass and be like, you pay me and go figure your shit out, right? Like it just can't work that way. They're now being participatory. And if they participate in the risk, it allows retailers to become artists again. You're like, I don't have to, I don't have to maximize every square inch to become revenue producing because I can create an experience. And in doing so, I'm going to attract people into this area and that's going to rejuvenate exactly. the neighborhood. And that's, what, that's, what, that's, what, that's, what, that's what really happened in, in the last 20 years in retail. People going safe. Yeah. And that's, that's the, you know, what is, what is the best seller for every brand? And then everybody's buying those best sellers and every brand that have a direct to consumer going after those best sellers and everybody have those best sellers and people get sick of them after one season. It's just like everybody looked the same with the same color palette, with the same projection. Everybody looked the same. Which, and, which, which to that point is why shopping on online is more interesting than shopping in physical because the products are more interesting. Everyone takes a safe route in physical but online, you find things that you couldn't even imagine finding in a store today, right? So people are people are experimenting in a way that they can't. And I think that there's a big part of this is like, is is really understanding how the economics of retailers will be able to like say, okay, let's give it a yeah. try. I've been, I've been buying I've been shopping vintage for the past couple of years. I have my 22 years old is shopping vintage because if it's like you know, there's nothing out there that he can put on that's going to make him feel like he's different than uh, others. So uh, it, it's a uh, bring back the uniqueness and the uniqueness has to do with less restriction, rent uh, stabilization, uh, and that would create the, bring back the creativity and people are going to be able to take risks again. So I have a question here that that just popped up. It says, I'm a design nut and a music nut in equal parts. Would love your take on why music seems like an afterthought in most retail spaces, even the best design ones. So it's a good question. You know, there's times when we, you know, when we do what we do at iCrave, we program music and we try to understand who we're trying to speak to and what the music should be about and how that's going to create like a, uh, a, a memory connection to a time in your life where you felt great. So if we're looking for people in their forties or fifties, we'll play journey from the eighties because that's going to be like your, you know, your first girlfriend or your first boyfriend or whatever it is. And you're kind of making these kind of connections. The answer, the answer in my perspective about music um, and, and, um, and design is that they, they, they want to be more hand in hand but the trigger for a lot of community boards or for a lot of like uh, landlords is that music means something else. If you say music, then you will become something that I don't want you to become. Or music doesn't fit in our pro forma because you're gonna have to hire bands or you're gonna have to have live and that's gonna become an ongoing operational cost. And I think it goes back for me every time we try and propose a new idea and it gets knocked down, it goes back to how are we going to operationalize it? Are we going to have the right to do it? What time can we do it until? So I think that people like, you know, Sam can speak to this. I think that people want music to be a front thing. We want to have a discoverable place where 
you know, like music could just become, you know, like natural. It should be natural. Music should happen on the street. It should happen in your store. It should there's so much music today. It's like it's like the most incredible time for young artists to have their own voice and to and to uh, broadcast what they want to say and what people what they want people to hear without you know like it being like done through the top forty and the top ten and whatnot. The problem really is, I think, is just like where it comes down to where it's been so far is trying to understand how to make the model work because real estate has really driven costs to the point where everyone cuts everything to the absolute bottom line. Does that sound accurate? Yeah. But uh, outside, outside of the real estate, I think, you know, there's also responsibility on the brands and operators to really dig and find their brand DNA and the core and what are they all about and what, you know, what is, you know, it's no longer put in a shirt and a pants and a hat on a shelf and trying to uh, and hoping that somebody's going to come and uh, buy it. You know, people want to have emotional connection to the brand because otherwise you become in a commodity. You know, what does it matter if you buy the sweatshirt for me or from uh, American Apparel or anybody else? It's, it's just, there's got to be an emotional connection. And, you know, music is one way to create emotional connection uh, and it's the lifestyle around it. So, I think every brand, every operator should have is its uh, DNA mix of uh, things, where it's the, the the colors, it's the visual, it's the music, it's the, the taste, it's the smell, it's the flavor, it's uh, uh, all those uh, things, you know. So you know, for us, we put somebody put over here about something about kids treats, you know. Kids treats was born because my partner Ronnie is obsessed with the uh, uh, cereal. So how do we make cereal for everyone to make, you know, so we took the ice cream and it mixed with the, all the cereals and we created because he grew up on cereal. So, you know, and that's kind of like the, the brand DNA because he is the creative director and he is the one who uh, ex, 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 uh, exposing himself and his love and passion to things through the brand and everything that he created is a reflection of his lifestyle and everything that he's all about. And, and, and to that point, and we were talking about music and like cereal, it's like uh, pinpoint your brand to it, a moment in your life that was positive and that was free. And that was like something that you actually have a positive memory with. And that's super important for people to understand about what brands need to do to become meaningful. So does it mean that people, you know, we, we we're doing a project and I'm like, um, Breakfast in America by Supertramp from 115 till 202. Let me play the whole album, right? People that you don't you don't play a whole album anymore, right? But if you did, if you were like, you know, I'm old, so I'm saying Supertramp, but you know, like it, it's like this kind of understanding about what kind of dwell time do you want from people? How do you want to create community in your space? And what kind of buy-in do you want to have authenticity? And I know that we, no one wants to use the word authenticity authenticity in a way that actually gives you a, a way to sort of connect with people. And I think cereal, Ronnie got it. Like he's like, you know, we have two small kids, three small kids now, two of them are eating cereal already. And it's kind of like cereal is the whole kind of connection to your youth. Right. And then your youth is your time when you're most kind of like un kind of tarnished about your ideals. And Kith is an untarnished ideal. You know, it's like, this is, a pure vision ideal that people are responding to in the real way. Can you speak to a little bit about Kith and, uh, and uh, the riots in New York and, and, and where you guys found yourself and how you responded to all that? Yeah, you know, uh, we, we got into this whole uh, uh, COVID situation in uh, March. We made all the alteration to the brand. We, uh, we had everyone walking very, uh, um, the, the company was actually very functional online, I must say, <laughs> opposed to like people coming to the office. It was a, a very efficient operation. And then the whole uh, Black Lives Matter uh, came right after. And I think a lot of the brands found themselves in a position of uh, almost like uh, um, in a defense 
situation where everybody being attacked for something. Everybody in America felt like they're being attacked and no matter what you say or wouldn't be good enough. You can't you can't because find you can't find any like stable ground to stand on. You can you can because you get shot for anything. For you get shot for saying something, you get shot for not saying something. And it was a very uh, uh, hard uh, moment for everyone that I've been talking to uh, in the industry. And um, there was a lot of pain from people about injustice across the board. And they had to take it out. They had to take it out uh, on the streets with burning stuff and destroying stuff. And they had to take it out on the web in many different ways, just like throwing, <laughs> you know, shooting arrows on people. And just like, um, and I think now, not that it's over, but people start realizing that it's better to communicate and it's better to fix things. And instead of just doing this, going into this council, uh, a mode of like anybody that said something or didn't say something or thought about something or you know just to move him and uh, cancel uh, uh, the brand and uh, you know instead of that let's educate people and work with them and yeah. that's where the stages uh, that we are now we really went back to our employees and had very open conversations about internally and trying to understand what changes we need to make internally for that. And then once we're ready with internally, we actually look into see how can we engage with the community and uh, do more uh, for the community. And, and uh, yeah. I think for us, it was a very good, uh, uh, interesting learning experience. Uh, to go through. Because... I think I think I think it's a, I think it's an important topic, and it's not it's not easy to manifest a solution like you said it's very hard to sort of to step here or step there and i understand that and um uh, and i i understand the fury and I, I you know you know even saying i understand the fury people will say to me you don't understand the fury because you don't understand the fury right and but i think that the convergence of all these factors retail was in trouble long before this started Digital is... The writing was on a wall for a long time. This was just instead of like having a very long, painful right. death, right. that was like... Let's just, let's just rid ourselves of this nonsense. So now you're like, okay, I have, we have all of us. And it requires city and state and, and, and banks and, and landlords and creatives and artists and retailers and people who have a passion to tell their story. Like we we're maybe talking internationally, but Sam and I are talking New York because that's what we know and that what we've lived. But the opportunity to say, you know, when people chose to march down the street, they chose Broadway because that's the street that everybody wants to say collect. It wasn't like there was a big like let's Broadway, let's march up Broadway three four nights and like it start to expand beyond that because everybody wants to choose a place that is like equal footing, equal ground. And you, you have know, to... Broadway because Broadway goes across the town from west down east, crossing every neighborhood, yeah. uptown, downtown, and midtown. And I think there was always symbolize the, the melting pot of New York City. Yeah. And I just think that if you can find a way that Broadway answers the question for everybody, it's my street. Right. I don't feel like a I don't feel like a uh, like a stranger on that street. I won't get looked at sideways if I walk in the store, if I'm walking down the street, if there's, there's stores spilling out, if we start to create indoor streetscapes, if we do all this stuff to just allow that, like the city needs mm. to embrace the idea that it's an organism and it, you got to let people enjoy it. You got to let people engage in it, not gentrify people out of it. It has to be inclusionary. It has to allow everyone to have a part of it. I think that it's, it, to me, it's a total tragedy what's happened to that street in the last 25 years. I mean, it's, 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 a I would love, to, I would love to see Broadway becoming a one massive bike lane. You know, it's like, I think 
uh, you know, instead of like having all those like small bike lanes on the street are very dangerous. I mean, I'm, I'm scared to drive, to ride my bicycle in New York City. You know, it's, it's, it's scary uh, between the yeah. taxi driver. <clears throat> it's, a, it's not a, a comfortable. Uh, I, think that, I think that's an interesting question about retail, right? Like, um, you know, the future of retail is about meandering and experiencing and finding things. And like the idea that you're like, you're not, the answer is not like, well, how will I get a cab when I leave with 10 bags? You're like, you don't leave with 10 bags. You have technology. They'll send your 10 bags home. Now go walk on the street where there's experiences and there's things happening. There's a band playing and there's like city outdoor seating and whatnot. We have to use both parts to it, right? But yeah. at the core of it, like you and I both, I know we both share this idea, even though we can disagree on a million things. Is like, there's like, it's about the soul of a city, right? Retail is the kind of, it's a kind of shared experience that everybody has, right? It's not going to be solved. And, you know, we probably haven't touched on technology enough, but um, uh, it's- I think it's, technology, it's, we, I think, there's enough technology to facilitate anything. You know, I think the, 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 the main problem is the desire. What is, what is, how to create the desire for someone to leave the house and come back to the streets and be part of it. Then there's enough technology to facilitate anything today. Well, here's a question that came up. It's how do we, how do you guys think emerging technology, um, augmented reality, increasing personalization from data, et cetera, can be used to synergize well with someone's physical retail experience and how should it not be used? Also shout out to Kith Treats. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the shout out. Um, I, 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 we, we, we're looking at on to all those uh, technologies and uh, at the end of the day, we kind of like choosing in the interface, it is actually more simple. We're simplifying the online for now, and we're really focusing on the more physical location activations and how can we bring physical uh, and make it more interesting. And I think, and then the follow-up is always on the online. And we really believe that uh, everybody focusing too much of technology and how to go online and how to go online. I think the emotional connection needs to be on the physical and that's where we put in most of our effort. And then behind the scene, yes, there's a lot of technology, but um, I think simplifying the um, connection and simplifying the process uh, is the key for everything. I think that, that I agree with that hundred percent. And, you know, I was, I just want to, I know we're running out of time here, but there's a couple of things I think are important. I think that the convergence of, to, 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 to make it simple, the convergence of retail and entertainment, right? Like those are seem obvious and they seem like everyone's poking around it. And you, you need to, we need to understand physical retail as an experiential uh, opportunity for people to have entertainment and people's entertainment dollars are trying to be spent on a lot of like come to this show come to that show come to this you, know, you got all of these pop-up museums of and all this kind of stuff that's super temporal right? everyone's trying to get your 39 dollars to come to the museum of this or the museum of that or come to this experiential show this immersive experience and all these things because they're lacking the opportunity to have an immersive experience of so spend the day shopping and grab a coffee and maybe have a maybe have an afternoon uh glass of wine with your friend and then, and then walk around the streets and meet some people and end up in a park. That's immersive experience at its best. That's a city that's like healthy. It doesn't require you to pay $39. The best days we ever had was like the days that we never planned. Yeah, you just, we were meandering the streets. Leave the house, meet some out. friends, and you end up in some exactly. random. All of this stuff being packaged into these experiences that can then be proliferated on social media for you to come and find this kind of, this Valhalla that you don't find because the cities are sick. And I do want to, I do want to emphasize that this is not a cataclysmic moment in time. This is a moment for New York to reinvent itself, right? This is a moment for New York to be like, and New York always never bet against New York city and never bet against, against real human interaction. And I think that, again, I apologize if we're too New York centric on this conversation, but that's what we know. Right. But, there's an opportunity right now to like grab this thing 
and really just like say, this is what we want it to be. And whoever raises their hand and says, we want it to be, we'll have a seat at that table. And it's not us. We're probably, Sam and I are probably too old for it. It's probably younger people. And we can just help encourage them to like, tell your story, bring your story out loud, be the voice. It's your turn to make this reality true. You know, because I sometimes joke in the studio that we're, you know, we're like millennial consultants to CEOs. Like they're like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. And there's a young generation has a big voice and it's time to bring it forward. And uh, by the way, I just want to say something about the, the technology and data that, uh, that wouldn't sound. For, for our brand, we feel like we are storytellers. We, we really communicate with the consumer. We tell in uh, the story and the story, the stories are very genuine. And uh, my partner, Ronnie, is a very good storyteller. And we don't really use any, uh, we don't advertise, we don't pay for anything on the internet uh, uh, because I think we are a very good storyteller. And I think that's what a lot of people are missing, a genuine story uh, that's going to be told that it's going to create the connection, the emotional connection with the brand. And when you don't have that, you need to push, to push, to push. We don't really push. We just putting the stuff out there and telling the story and creating beautiful products that are coming from uh, the inside. And that's how uh, we build the brand that it uh, doesn't need a uh, heavy push from the outside. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, look, I think we're, uh, we're pushing up against time. Um, please don't bet against New York City. <laughs> and, uh, the future of retail and its demise have largely been exaggerated. There are only experiments and new, new, new things to come that are going to be, I think, wildly interesting. I, I, I believe that. I believe that we have a really, really great moment right now to grab a hold of it and invent it. I am. I am a very, very uh, big believer in uh, a lot of great things going to come out of this uh, uh, disaster. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. My name is Lionel Hayden from iCrave, Sam Ben Abraham from Kith. I hope you guys enjoyed your time with us. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll follow. Away. We'll find a way to follow through.